Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Project Witness webinar, which will explore the life and times of Rabbi Mordechai Glassin Zatzal. Joining us today is Rabbi Daniel Glassin, who is a rabbi of Kahal Teferis Mordechai, actually named after his grandfather. Rabbi Glatstein is a rav of Kahal Teferis Mordechai, as well as a very popular speaker on a vast variety of topics on Medrash, Agada, Tehira, um, Dafyemi, Chumash, and he has a very, very large following of followers of Shurim. He's also a prolific speaker who has visited several continents, very popular speaker, and today we'll hear why. Um, Rabbi Glatstein is also the author of a number of Svarim, some in Lashon HaKadosh, entitled Magad HaRakiya on Chumash, as well as some art school publications. One is called The Darkness and the Dawn, which deals with the upcoming three weeks and nine days. Also, that book has not a lot of information about his grandfather, as well as a book about Purim called The Concealed and the Revealed, and an upcoming volume, which is going to be about his grandfather's life. So today, we will focus on the life and times of Rabbi Mordechai Glatz Senior. I just want to give a bit of an introduction why this has always fascinated me so much, because it's highly unusual that you should have uh, someone who survived the entire war from Poland, not from Hungary, where other areas which had a, a, a smaller exposure to the Nazis, but from the beginning of the war, we have the story of someone who lived through it from beginning to end in the Warsaw Ghetto, post-war ghetto, concentration camps, liberation, and then went on to rebuild his life in a beautiful family here in the United States. He was a rub in Pittsburgh for many years, and obviously the foremost event that shaped his life was the Holocaust. And today we're going to hear about Rabbi Mordechai Glatstein, his youth, the war years, and post-war years. It is my distinct pleasure to introduce Rabbi Daniel Glatstein, who's going to tell us about his illustrious grandfather. Rabbi Glatstein, welcome. Good morning, Rabbi Lefkowitz. How are you? Shalom Aleichem. Baruch Hashem. Good to have you. It's an honor to be here. You know, hearing you talk about my grandfather, and many people know him as a one of the great survivors of the war, a builder of Jewish life after the war, experiences that are hard to capture in words. Um, but to me, he was my grandfather. And to hear you speak about him, <laughs> even though I've spoken about my grandfather so many times, I'm constantly speaking about him, I can't help but be Yore Demais because uh, he, was, he was a, you know, the word unique, is a uh, very overused and and uh, almost meaningless word, but it applies aptly to my grandfather. He was a tzaddik um, in the real sense of the word. And the Amloy Dimyon, it's hard to find, it's hard to say, yeah, I know a tzaddik similar to him. No, he had no, he had no parallel. He had no comparison. Um, as just as a, a, compassionate individual you know after everything that he saw and experienced he wrote uh, he once wrote an article entitled uh, Jewish Theological Reflections on the Holocaust and he paraphrases the words of Yirmiyahu he says Ani Ani I'm the man I saw the affliction of my people he writes I saw the Warsaw Ghetto with thousands of skeletons extending their bony arms you know he saw the murder of his family but instead of him becoming coarsened, he became more compassionate. I would say uh, he, he, he devoted his life to show Rachamim to, to the downtrodden, to the, to the elderly, to the infirm, to the mentally incompetent. And, you know, if you would have seen my grandfather with... He was a regal person. He was an elegant person. He was royalty. He was compassionate. You would have expected someone of his stature. He must have grown up in uh, with two uh, loving parents in peaceful times with the most nurturing and upbeat upbringing. And what, what's really remarkable is that uh, he did have nurturing parents, but his father passed away when he was very, very young. His father uh, passed away 
and something like 1917 from the Spanish flu. And he doesn't, he didn't have, I think his father was about, was 26 years old. He doesn't have memories of his father other than he saw his father's toe at the funeral because, you know, they would cover the body with the sheep. So he grew up as a Yasim and uh, his mother was a big tzaddik, as Blima Michla. And she had a store, so she single-handedly supported the family. Um, but my grandpa would, would say over, just, you know, I mentioned uh, my great-grandma, my grandpa would say over that there was a, a, a time that he was very ill, was deathly ill. And he remembers seeing his mother at his bedside, and she would raise her hands to the Shamayim, and shortly after he had a recovery, he remembers his mother would say to him, Mardcha, learn Mishnayis. And my grandfather was something like a child prodigy. He was an Eloy. So um, his two other brothers, I don't think, attended Yeshiva Gedoyla, but he was sent away to Plotsk to learn by Michal Rubinstein, who was a student of his grandfather. And when when his mother traveled from Warsaw to, to hear, you know, how's her son uh, doing, and the Rebbe gave a good report. The Rebbe said, you know, the that your son's learning very well, he's destined for greatness. She she had come to make some money to support the family. She gave all the money to the yeshiva as a carbon taida in gratitude for uh, for that piece of good news. So he grew up only really with a mother, and then the war broke out in, uh, when he was a young adult, and he saw he saw you know Gehenna here on this on on this earth, and he saw the extent of human cruelty, and he emerged with such compassion and empathy that uh, to have an individual emerge from the crucible of, of the Holocaust, uh, such a rachleva, such a soft-hearted, compassionate, sensitive individual, uh, it's really one of the great miracles of, of history. Um so what town? What town was this? Where, where he okay, grew so up? Okay, so my grandfather uh, was born in the city of Lipna. Lipna is uh, so, is outside of Warsaw. Mm -hmm. um, his father's father, his name was Mardchaleb, and he, he, the reason he was named Mordechai is he was born on Vav Adar, so his bris was Yud Gimel Adar. His bris was Tainas Esther, and they named him Mordechai after because it was Purim time. He was named after his. Uh, grandfather, Ramard Khaleb Blatstein. And, and we like to say it was, some, it was somewhat um, prophetic because he was destined to be a great hero for the for the Jewish people in facing Amalek and facing Haman. Um, some of his background, his grandfather, Mard Khaleb Blatstein, was a Rav in the city of Lynchitz. Lynchitz was Ir Ve'em Yisrael, is a renowned city of Torah scholarship and the, the Kliakar was a Rav in Lynchitz and my grandfather's grandfather was was a Rav in the city of Lynchitz. At the time we're going back now to the 1860s at the time that my great great grandfather was a Rav in Lynchitz the Malbim who had a very difficult rabbinic career he was he had a run from one rabbinic post to the next because reform movement and all kinds of difficulties that he encountered. The Malbum um, resided in Lynchitz and began working on his uh, commentary on the Tanakh in the city of Lynchitz. So he became a dear friend of my great, great grandfather. So to my grandfather, who didn't know his father and only sort of knew of his grandfather, the Malbum was like, he never met the Malbum, but the Malbum was like his revered uncle. Literally. So my grandfather did not go a day of his life without studying the works of the, of the Malbum. My grandfather did not go an hour of his life without speaking about the Malbum. My grandfather was attached in, uh, uh, spiritually to the, to the ideals and the teachings of the Malbum. In fact, my grandfather's initials, Mart Chaleb Ben Yosef Menachem, are Malbum. Wow, that's so um, Malbum... Uh, is uh, Mayor Leibish Ben Yechiel Michal. In fact, I have, I'm going to go off script. I hope this is okay. But I have uh, the copy of my grandfather's uh, Malbum. Um, sorry, I, I, I disappeared there for a second. But um, this is my grandfather's Malbum that he brought over from Europe. And uh, he wrote many, many notes on the Malbum. In fact, uh, 
after liberation, after he came to America, and we'll, we'll discuss that later, but uh, aside from being uh, a Rav in, in uh, a Bekehila, he was also the chief chaplain of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Um, Pennsylvania has many um, insane asylums, if you may, and my grandfather would go from one downtrodden person to another, giving what he called Torah therapy based on the teachings of the Malbim on Sefer Mishlein. So my grandpa was very attached to the Malbim. And think about it. I'm growing up and I have a grandfather who could take me back to the 1860s, right? A, a, <laughs> 160 years early. It's, it was really, uh, really remarkable. So this is the background my grandfather grew up in. His mother's father, his name was Pesach Moshe Goldman, who came from the city of Lipna. And he was a student of Rabbi Shua Lamikutna. Rabbi Shua Lamikutna was one of the great Polish, um, great Polish gedolim, great minds. And my grandfather's grandfather, my grandfather's mother's father, helped Rabbi Shua Lamikutna in publishing the Yeshua Smalkoi. And this was my grandfather's uh, background. Before the war, he already had smicha from Rav Shlomo David Kahana. Rav Shlomo David Kahana was the Rav of Warsaw. Uh, he was later known as the Aviho Agunais. That's what Ramosha refers to him as in uh, in, in the Igor Ramosha. And he later became the Rav of, of uh, Yerushalayim. And I I was lucky to be at Rav Shlomo David Kahana's kever. He's buried in Sanhedria. And my grandfather remained close with him, but he had smicha before the war from Rav Shlomo David Kahana and from other Rabbonim. And he had a, a very strong kesher with uh, the Goyen of all of Europe, Rabbi Nachem Zemba. Uh, Rabbi Nachem Zemba was the preeminent God Hadar. Even though he was a Gera Chassid, and he was a loyal Gera Chassid who went to the Rebbe's Tish. Um, in fact, I heard from Talmidim of Rabbi Nachem Zemba that Rabbi Nachem Zemba would go to the Tish and he would sit there among the crowd like everybody else. And one time when the Tish was over, the guy behind him, you know, so he was so pressed so closely to Rabnachim Zemba. He was he had his elbow, you know, like like pressuring into the back of Rabnachim Zemba for many hours. And he apologized. He said that must have been very uncomfortable. Rabnachim Zemba said, "No, when we go to the Rebbe, we're all equal." So Rabnachim Zemba was uh, adin nefesh, really a uh, very refined soul. Aside from his tremendous godless batar. My grandfather would say that behind him was a svarim shrank, but, you know, not like we have, we have a svarim shrank of other people's svarim. Behind him was a svarim shrank just of his own manuscripts. He had a commentary on the whole Yushami, on the whole Rambam, on tens of thousands of pages of Chidut Shetar. Kimat everything was lost. Almost everything was lost, except for Toitzah Chaim. So my grandfather was literally a Ben Bias by Rav Menachem Zemba. Now, my grandfather's was... Uh, two best friends were uh, Rabbi Nachum Zemba's nephews, Itchemeyer Zemba and Rav Zemba. Did that connection was that forged after they um, they were forced into the ghetto, or obviously they knew each other beforehand? No, they they were um, they were very close even before the war broke out. So my grandfather um, said he was, he was a Ben Bias by Rabbi Zemba even before the war. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the war breaks out, and like many many people. From people don't really know this, but Warsaw Ghetto was not just the the home, unfortunately, to the Jews of Warsaw, but the Germans forced the surrounding areas, Jews from all areas, to be forced into rather small, cramped quarters, and that's how your father ended up there, along with his mother, a grandfather. I'm sorry, I'm mortified. My grandfather ended up in the Warsaw Ghetto. Um, regarding. Um, my grandfather's mother, I can't say for certain that she was in the in the Warsaw Ghetto, mm -hmm. but my grandfather, my grandfather definitely was in the Warsaw Ghetto with Ramanachem Zemba and Ramanachem Zemba's two nephews, Itchemeyer and Avram Shazemba. Now, I know this is a matter of great controversy, but my grandfather was together with Ramanachem Zemba during the Warsaw Ghetto uprising. Not only that, he served as Rav Menachem Zemba's personal lookout during the uprising. And he told me personally that Rav Menachem Zemba certainly uh, did encourage the uprising. Now, I know there, there, there's a difference of opinion about that, but I guess 
it's always easy to argue about something that you don't have firsthand knowledge about. But, uh, you know, I'm telling you what my grandfather uh, told me numerous times. Um, there may be in writing that Menachem Zemmer originally did not uh, advocate for the uprising, but but things definitely changed once uh, there was systematic liquidation uh, of Jewish people, the likes of which the world had never seen. You see, originally, um, I want to tell you something very interesting. You know that uh, in the worst, my grandfather was together with the Piyatzetz Nareba, with other Gedolim, and my grandfather, in one of his articles, I believe in Dasiyah the Shavart, writes that the Gedolim there got together to try to write the Hashkofas HaToyra on what was happening. And the Pietzitz Nareba actually wrote a book explaining the meaning of what was taking place. And that book, I don't think uh, we don't have it, but this is the book that my grandfather writes about, uh, writes about in his memoirs. Um, you know, back back to the to the uprising. So my grandfather was together with, with Rabbi Nachum Zemba, and uh, of course, after liquidation of the ghetto, he was in in uh, many different camps. Um, he was in Radom, he was in Auschwitz, he was in Dachau. I believe he was in others as well. In uh, Radom, there is a story that's uh, become rather well known now about how my grandfather and his brother smuggled in a pair of tefillin. Radim was under the very brutal um, control of a Russia by the name of Ficus. If Ficus catches you putting on a pair of tefillin, you know, he, he shoots you in the head on the spot. And every morning, my grandfather would wake up at the crack of dawn. He would put on the tefillin, and he would then give it to his brother to put on the tefillin. One particular morning, my grandfather wakes up, and my grandfather uh, puts on the tefillin. He then gives it to his brother, Chanoi Chenach. Uh, Uncle Chenach puts on the tefillin Shalyad. Just as he's about to put on the tefillin Shalroish, Ficus barges in. He sees this Jew putting on the tefillin. He picks up the gun to shoot. But then he takes a look at the tefillin Shalroish perched on the head of the Sadik. He chapped a sitter. He panicked. He put the gun down and he ran out in fear. And my grandfather said this was an open miracle. The Gemara says, Vero kal kishem Hashem nikra lecha v'yarmi mecha elu tefillin shabaroish. The Gemara bracha says, my grandfather says it was a it was a nice galoy. So even though it was very dark times, and it was what we call Hester shabatoicha Hester astara betoicha astara, but they also saw Giloy Shechina. They saw the Moira Gado. They saw Giloy Shechina. So that was in Radom. In Auschwitz. We go back to, to, to Warsaw for a minute. You mentioned he was a, he was a lookout for, for Menachem Zemba. What, yes. what, was that due to, 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 to protect him while he was learning or to other activities where people came to meet him? Or what was that role exactly? My grandpa would say that he was a lookout because he had very good eyesight. In fact, uh, my grandfather never wore glasses, and he passed away at 106 years old. Oh. I actually, one time my grandfather used to cut out these little uh, clippings from the paper or something, and I remember seeing in one of the clippings that eating carrots is good for the eyes. So I, kn I know that he prided himself that he had good eyesight. What the nature of this, you know, lookout, mm -hmm. um, you know, I can't tell you. But any other any other activity he's involved in with in any specific like group of Bachrim or uh, maybe Hasidus that he was involved in the Warsaw Ghetto? Or there's there's so many organizations that were so dedicated to keeping Jews alive. The whether the soup kitchens or whether it was food smuggling. Um, did he ever talk about the the daily life in the ghetto and how and how he interacted with other Jews? Or simple it was a simple simple act, simple survival. You know, my grandfather didn't speak a lot about um, the years in the camps. Mm -hmm. You know, I I, I could, uh, he describes in his memoirs the hungry children, starving, living skeletons, corpses. Um, but but it, the, the ghetto life was filled with the highest forms of sacrifice and heroism. He talks about a web, a web of self-help institutions, underground shuls, chadarim, minyanim, learning. 
Um, and then he writes about how he would visit the Piyatsetsna Rebbe and the uh, Ramanacham Zamba. Mm. And oh, here it is. He says that the Rebbe wrote a book called Yam Dam. Yam Dam, Sea of Blood. Mm. And unfortunately, that it was lost during the evacuation of the ghetto. You know, they found a lot of the writings of the Piyatsetsna Rebbe. Uh, but uh, can you imagine if they would would have found, if they would find the work on, you know, the the theological philosophical outlook al pihatoira on what was taking place but right. that's something that we struggle with today now it's the truth is that in his, the ish kaidish which which people are not so aware of, he was not the um the author of that title he 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 um he wrote it was something called mishnah Sazam, the the the, the, the drushes mishnah Sazam, but he did not coin the title ish kaidish that was coined later you mentioned it, it was it was discovered in the 50s buried in that now famous uh, milk jug um, as they were excavating new portions of Warsaw. But yes, you're right. This was, that, that I guess it did offer some uh, hashkafa glimpses based on the Torah from his weekly drushes, but that wasn't the, that wasn't the focal point. That was a, a drushes. But, right. but yeah, we have, again, now we have how the two things dovetail. We have the Byzantine's account. We have your grandfather who was there as in the audience as uh, someone who could give us from that perspective of what type of chizik and how people went to this Piazzetna for for chizik during these dark times. We talked about that they were forced to a labor camp called Bedzin, and he's together with uh, Avram Chazemba, the Chamayer Zamba, and he said that Avram Chazemba was a great expert in the Torah of the Ger Rebbe. So my grandfather's father was a Ger Chassid. Um, in fact, he was a secretary for the Ger Rebbe, and I mentioned before he died at a very young age, he died doing a shlichus for the Ger Rebbe at 26 years old. So my grandfather was very attached to Ger, and uh, my grandfather said in, in the dark Golas nights, they would they would discuss the Torah of the Sfas Emes. That was something that gave them a lot of chizuk, a lot of meaning, a lot of uh, strength during those dark times. But uh, my grandfather writes in his memoirs that the learning they did, the Torah that they engrossed themselves in, is really if da, when David Amelach said Lule Shashui if he said it prophetically about any particular era, it was referring to the experiences that he went through because he 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 said there's no question that the Torah that they studied gave them the the encouragement to uh, persevere to some extent. Some of the memoirs of my grandfather in Auschwitz are really the most uh, powerful, compelling. First of all, he writes that when he got to Auschwitz, I mean, this is, I heard from him personally, when he got to Auschwitz, the, so the first thing he sees is that the old people were being carried off to be gassed and they were crying and they were, they, what were they crying? Not that they were going to be killed. They were crying, who's going to say Kaddish for us? Who's going to say Kaddish for us? And my grandfather remembers thinking, who's going to say Kaddish for you? Who's going to say Kaddish for me? You're, you're, you're an elderly, maybe you have children, grandchildren. Who's going to say Kaddish for me? I'm, I'm not married. And my grandfather accepted upon himself that if he would ever survive, then um, he would take it upon himself to say Kaddish for all of these Kaddishim, which he did. He, for 70 years, he never missed saying Kaddish for the Kadoshim. He always he said Kaddish every single minion for the Kadoshim. In Auschwitz, he was together a, a few things. They would beat my grandfather. They would beat him. They say, Rabbi, because my grandfather's always praying. He was always praying. Say, what are you praying for? You think the Jewish people have a future? The Jewish people have no future. We Germans, we will eradicate the Jews of Europe. The Jews of Palestine, the Arabs will destroy the Jews of Palestine. And the Jews of America, ha, the Jews of America will take care of themselves. And unfortunately, what the Germans were most correct about were the Jews of America. Because while they did a pretty good job of eradicating the Jews of Europe, but there were survivors. And while the Jews of Palestine had a miraculous salvation, but unfortunately, more Jews have disappeared in the spiritual holocaust of America than in Europe. 
And this goes to show that Hitler was very, very aware of the state of world Jewry. And uh, my grandfather writes, I saw this in his notes, that when he was in Auschwitz, the I, he saw Eichmann, and Eichmann invited a special guest from uh, Jerusalem. He invited the Mufti from Jerusalem to, to sit with him, and they were entertained as Jews would pass in front of them, and uh, they would hit the Jew in a way that the Jew would not be able to uh, procreate. That was their entertainment in, in Auschwitz. And my grandfather uh, notes that if you want to know what Auschwitz is, it's the union of Esau and Yishma. Remember in Parshas Taldois, when Esau got very angry at Yaakov Avinu. So what does Esau do? He says, Vayelach Esau, and he takes the daughter of Yishmael as a wife. See, when Esau the Gura writes in his commentary to the Safra de Tzniusa, that if Esau and Yishmael ever unite, they would destroy the whole world. It's what we call the union of the Shar and the Hamar. Esau is compared to a Shar, and Yishmael is compared to a Hamar. That's why we can't mix the two. But if Esau and Yishmael would ever get together, that's why Hashem makes a great miracle. They could, the East and the West can never get along, right? We wish both sides Hatzlach Araba. But if they would ever get together, they would destroy the world. You want to you want a picture of what the union of Esav and Yishmael looks like? Auschwitz. That's the result of the union of Esav and Yishmael. Um, one Pesach night, my grandfather uh, joined us for Pesach. We were in Flatbush. We were going to show the Agoda of uh, Avenue L, Nostrand Avenue, and my grandfather, of course, was from you know the Asar Rishonim, if not earlier. And he comes into shul. I was with him. And walking into shul was a man, a tzaddik by the name of Meyer Yechiel Lachman, who they were together in Auschwitz. And here they have, they reunite 65 years later in a shul in Flatbush. And this uh, Meyer Yechiel Lachman turns to me, he says, you know, your grandfather, he knows how to daven. So, you know, I'm thinking, you know, no kidding, he knows how to daven. He said, yeah, but you don't even know what I mean when I say he knows how to daven. I saw him in Auschwitz. He was davening, and the Nazi would come and club him on the head, and he would fall to the floor, and he would dust himself off. He would brush himself off. He would stand up, and he would continue davening right where he was up to, as if to say that there's nothing the Nazis could do. He's he's not he's not even um, there's nothing they could do to derail us from our mission in this world. You know, he's above that. He transcends that. And this was a very important limo. This was a very important lesson. That's what I mean, that your grandfather knows how to daven. Oh. It, and from Auschwitz, was that the first, was that where they were deported from Warsaw to Auschwitz? Or he was in someone? Or I, no, I, it well, might be blurry, the whole sequence yeah, of events. Well, how, so. Um... What the Masois were, you know, yeah. from one to the other. Um, you know, my grandpa would always say, they're always Membe's Masois. But, you know, uh, um, there was Radom, there was Bedzin, there was Auschwitz, and uh, ultimately Dachau. My mm -hmm. brother Ari uncovered, um, he discovered that Yad Vashem has the, the notes that my grandfather wrote of what happened on the death march that he was in um, in Dachau as the war was coming to an end. And my grandfather writes about how these skeletons, these near corpses are walking and they're emaciated, they're hunger stricken, they're disease ridden, and they're walking mile after mile after mile in the scorching heat. And he would hear, he hears voices in the back. I can't go on anymore. And bodies were dropping. And my grandfather looks at these Yidid marching with him. And he can't help but think, these are the dry bones that the Navi Yecheskel saw. When the Navi Yecheskel saw the vision of the Ha'atzamois Ha'yeveshois, this is the vision of Yecheskel. And Yecheskel asks, Ha'atzamois Ha'yeveshois, could these bones ever come to life? And upon liberation, in fact, the Navi is being told, yes, these, these bones could come to life. So he's liberated 
from Dachel, and my father made a calculation that you know, Dachel was the last camp to be liberated. It was, and it was liberated literally on Lag Ba'imer, 1945. And my grandfather, at the end of the war, after this death march, he's hauled onto uh, these cattle cars where they were headed to the Turo Mountains to dig their own graves. And the American army bombs the railroad tracks. And when the, the Nazis realized that, that the uh, Germans were coming, so when the Nazis realized that the American army was coming, so that they knew their life was in danger, they quickly take off the, took off their uh, Nazi uniforms, they put it on the survivors, and they took the, the survivors' begadim, and they put it on. But when the American army landed, they were not duped by the scheme because the Nazis were fat hogs, and the, the Jewish inmates were, were walking cadavers. And my grandfather was liberated by the American army by General Henning Linden. And the general uh, sees my grandfather. Now, one, one detail I didn't mention is that aside from the fact that my grandfather had smicha before the war, and he was close with many gedolim, he, uh, he also had a degree. He was um, highly educated. And, you know, that's something that we don't see often in our world. Uh, again, he comes from a, a family of Gera Hasidim. He learned in the in great yeshivas of Plotsk. He was he had smicha from Shlomo Davikana, but he also had some kind of uh, formal doctorate, so he knew English. So the American army, the American general, said, "Rabbi, okay, you're liberated. Here's my gun. Shoot, take revenge against the enemy." And my grandfather said, "Revenge. I I leave revenge to the Almighty." It's been five years since I've been. Reunited with my Talmud, Masachta Baba Basra. I'm now reunited with my Talmud. That's my freedom. I leave revenge to the Almighty. And uh, my grandfather was Zoycha to see great grandchildren learning Masachta Baba Basra. The greatest so, revenge of all. Yeah, what? That would that's be the, the greatest, greatest revenge of all, yes. Yeah, that's the greatest revenge. Yeah, um, there was Hans Moration, did he did he meet any um I don't remember reading did did he meet Eisenhower or he was not he was not uh... yes yes um it's important that you bring up Eisenhower because as I mentioned my grandfather knew English so upon liberation he was made the head of the religious department of the Joint Distribution Committee and in that capacity they gave my grandfather army uniform a jeep. And when Eisenhower came to the DP camps, he was Eisenhower's translator for the Kloisenberger Rebbe and the Kloisenberger Rebbe's translator for Eisenhower. Um, and my grandfather, upon liberation, he felt that he was being infused with the Ruach HaLekim Amala, that God was infusing him with strength to do whatever he could to rebuild, to resurrect, to resuscitate the... Uh, Okay, so thank you. So you were discussing your interaction, the interaction of your grandfather with General Eisenhower. Yeah, so when Eisenhower came to the camp, as I mentioned, my grandfather served as Eisenhower's translator to the Kloisenberger Rebbe and the Rebbe's translator for Eisenhower. Um, so my grandfather was one of the notable uh, activists and askanim and um, personnel working on behalf of the survivors in his capacity as the head of the religious department of the joint, the Joint Distribution Committee. Um, my grandfather built mikvois in all the DP camps. He built Talmud Torahs in the DP camps. He published svarim in the DP camps. The first svarim he published were the Evan Shlema of the Gra that I'm holding up here and the Leiv David of the Chida. You know, I always wonder, I, ha I feel such a strong Kesher to the Chida. I always, uh, I'm very connected to his Torah. You look on my, my shelf over there, I have a shelf and a half of all the Swarm of the Chida. In the other room, I have many more Swarm from, from the Chida. And uh, I can't help but think that because uh, after the war, the first Sefer published was the Leiv David of the Chida. You see it's published in the Army, American Army Green. And inside you have the stamp, American Joint Distribution Committee. So, you know, the Chida, he, he's uh, looking out for us. Um, mm -hmm. And my grandfather was close with a lot of, uh, with all the organizations, every organization, not just one 
all the Jewish active organizations, my grandfather uh, helped them out. And his most um, fulfilling task was helping the survivors rebuild and relocate themselves after the war. So in order to do so, you, would, you needed to have a sponsor, either in America or in Israel, family or friends who was willing to vouch for you. So my grandfather would, you know, read the papers. And if uh, somebody would put in an ad, you know, I, ha I think maybe I have a relative in the camps. My grandfather would be Mashadik people with their family, either in Eretz Yisrael or in, in America. And he literally helped thousands of families rebuild their life. Um, we weren't even aware that my grandfather was involved in this. And, and uh, my grandfather, my grandmother was telling us about it. And we said, you know, Zaidi, how, how many people did you help? Uh, dozens, hundreds? Of my, no, my grandmother said thousands. In fact, they didn't leave Europe until 1951 until every single survivor who wanted to leave was given that opportunity where my, grandma, my grandmother said, you know, now it's our turn. We have to rebuild our own lives. And uh, that's what they did. You know, I, I want to speak about his uh, post-war activities, but I would be remiss if I didn't mention that you know, he built yeshivas in all the in all the DP camps. He built girls' schools in all the DP camps. One particular camp that uh, my grandfather went to, he was greeted by a uh, he was greeted by a uh, group of people led by a young girl who was uh, very charming, who was the daughter of the Rav of Sachachov, the last Rav of Sachachov. She was uh, a young teenager, and she was appointed. Uh, to lead this delegation to greet the American army and the and the religious department of the joint, led by my grandfather. And my grandfather noticed her, and he uh, inquired, and he was told that she was the daughter of the love the Rav of Sachachev, who my grandfather uh, knew knew of. And uh, he wrote to her after, and my grandmother was much younger than him, and he said, uh, you know, when when it comes time for you to rebuild your life, you know, keep me in mind. And so when he built that girls' school for that camp, he also picked out uh, a kala for himself. And uh, they married soon after in, in Munich. If uh, if I may, I could show you a picture of oh, their kasana in uh, Munich. Now here, here's the here's a picture of the kasana, my grandfather, my grandmother, and you know you see survivors who smiling but you see the pain in their eyes as well and this is their ksuba going back to uh, uh munich mm -hmm. what year was uh, that uh what year was that i want to say it's a, a september 3rd 1947 Yudches Elol, wow. wow incredible incredible so he devotes the next three years of his life after he's married to helping other youth in, in uh, DP camps, and in 1951, he arrives in the United States, only after he feels that his work is done on the European continent. Yes. And he, I assume he arrives in New York, and what what brought him to Pittsburgh? Okay, so um, he came to Pittsburgh because since he was working for the American Army, one of the um, senators who traveled to the DP camp, he befriended, and this, this uh, American official had connections to jobs in America, he found my grandfather Steller. Now, I was just thinking this morning, you know, there were many jobs available at the time. And many Orthodox Rabbonim, even Big Tamicham, took jobs in shuls affiliated with conservative and reform movement. It was extremely common, especially because the salary from a uh, conservative reform shul was 10 times that of an Orthodox shul. And my grandfather, being a very worldly person, had many lucrative offers, which he never accepted. He would only uh, accept a job in Orthodox Kila because he wanted to teach Gemara. Again, the lines then were not as uh, black and white as they are today. But my grandfather knew that he's a Tamra of Menachem Zem, of the Great Yishev Zem. He, would, he wanted to be able to teach Gemara. So his first job was in, in Pittsburgh, in, on the East End, in the Taras Chaim Shul. And he was a rav in many prestigious kehilais. Um, towards in his later years, 
He was also um, a chaplain in the Riverview Home for the Aged and the Weinberg Village, where my grandfather, uh, his whole life, he had special compassion for the elderly because of what he saw in Auschwitz, where the where the elderly were just disposed of. Mm-hmm. So he had a special compassion for Zekenim, Zekenos, for Choyle Hanefesh, and he would 